Uh, hey, can everyone hear me okay? I know we're a smaller group. Uh, I'm going to try to project, but uh, the mic is there too. How's everyone doing? Amazing. We'll let our stragglers, uh, it's just my team coming in. But uh, hey, uh, thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Adrienne Smith, and I'm here with Evolving Web. We're super happy to be uh, core sponsors this year at MidCamp, and personally, it's my first time here, so it's really nice to connect with all of you and see what everyone else is doing. Um, yeah, so uh, let's get into it. Uh, a bit about me, so I'm currently a senior digital strategist, again with Evolving Web. We're a full service uh, uh, agency for web design, development, maintenance, hosting. Uh, we pretty much uh, do it all. And uh, more personally, I'm actually a librarian by training. So uh, anything that's around information retrieval and classification, the talk before was amazing also. Uh, yeah, that's sort of in my uh, wheelhouse. And I've spent the last 10 years working really on uh, the digital side of things, so designing websites, intranets, uh, optimizing search engines internally. I was with the Yellow Pages in Canada for a little bit, uh, as well as building out things like social networks, employee profiles, anything that's really around uh, focusing on enterprise content management and knowledge management. So uh, again, uh, today we're going to focus a bit more on some of the stuff that's uh, back of house, so uh, information architecture, taxonomies, metadata, and uh, the stuff that's a little more visible too in terms of uh, content uh, management, governance, style, voice and tone. So uh, yeah, and again, uh, if you haven't had a chance, please uh, do so before the break. Check out Evolving Web. I see some people have grabbed some stickers. We're happy to represent Montreal. Go Habs, go. And uh, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, uh, let's do it. Uh, yeah, so my talk today, it's essentially to do the opposite of this. So uh, putting the content strategy uh, horse uh, behind the cart. And again, I know in web design, we all have our expertise. We like to sort of stay in our domain. I'm a developer, I'm a designer, I do a UX. Uh, at the same time, I think it's uh, really, really important to uh, try to move away as much as we can. And again, there's been a big movement in project management to moving away from waterfall into more agile, iterative. And it's something that at Evolving Web we take really seriously too, in that our different uh, expertise teams try to work closely together, do a lot of knowledge transfer. Uh, again, the worst case scenario for our client uh, services agency is being able to design something amazing that our developers have no idea, have no time, have no money uh, to actually uh, build. So uh, by uh, trying to uh, bring content strategy as well as UX and visual and tech a bit closer together, uh, we really are trying to make the process uh, more efficient, more effective, and uh, yeah, building the best experiences we can at the end of the day. So uh, the goal is really to talk about uh, a bit more concretely what content strategy is and how we can really save time and money and uh, lots of headaches in uh, doing it a bit more uh, hand in hand. So a bit of the agenda, I'll sort of set the context with a bit of uh, the design process overall, at least uh, how we do it, but obviously there are many flavors of that. And then uh, really try to be a bit more uh, uh, practical about what are we talking about when we say content strategy. Uh, and yeah, and then wrap up with doing a bit more of uh, the complementary uh, aspect of everything, and really killing uh, sometimes more than two birds, uh, but uh, hopefully a one stone, uh, making that stone a little bigger. Uh, yeah, so uh, the context. Uh, so at Evolving Web, uh, we're really sort of working with these sort of four uh, larger phases when we tackle these big uh, web design projects, whether it's a brand new site or we're working with a redesign, something that's sort of uh, uh, yeah, been uh, past its expiration date. So I'm just going to walk through the big uh, phases and talk about what types of questions are we actually trying to answer and sort of setting up how we have UX and visual content and tech development uh, collaborate. None of these exist in a vacuum, so obviously we shouldn't be creating them in one either. Uh, first up, uh, so the discovery phase. Uh, this is really where we're trying to gather all the information that we can. Uh, particularly, I don't know if any of you are coming from uh, client-based agencies. There's what the client uh, says that they want, think that they want, what the users are saying, what uh, other sources are saying. So again, we've really all been there, but uh, again, the goal is really to try to be as objective as possible and quantitative and really infuse that with a sort of 360 view of uh, what's actually happening, what problems are we trying to solve, what needs do users have. Sometimes we'll have people come up and say, everything's bad, we have to fix it. But at the same time, uh, we often cover things that are working quite well. Sometimes we see some workarounds that people are very attached to, so that's a whole other uh, game of uh, change management. 
but uh, overall, the idea is really to sort of uh, uh, sort of understand the the gap between uh, where we are today and where we're trying to go. Uh, so some of the questions, uh, what are users actually trying to do? Uh, where are the business goals? How far away are those things or close together? Uh, again, uh, what's working, what's not? Uh, what types of journeys are our users going on? Who are our users and do they have similar journeys? Where are they overlapping? Um, and yeah, essentially, uh, what pain points do we have? What opportunities can we identify along the way? And uh, finally, and this is really critical in terms of the, the strategy aspect of all of this, uh, how are we measuring success? So again, if we're not aligned on that, first of all, and I'll shout out to our great project managers here who uh, keep us honest, uh, yeah, uh, we really don't have a, <laughs> too much of a, um, a basis for uh, evaluating uh, how well we're doing. Uh, next up, so designing and testing. So really uh, taking all the different uh, uh, discovery uh, artifacts, outcomes, uh, it's really the time when we're sort of able to, uh, you know, let our imagination uh, run wild, uh, and that's really across the board, whether it's uh, working from, uh, again, new modules we want to implement, new functionalities we want to create, uh, new ways of uh, displaying content. Uh, really what's important is to, uh, to test, to go uh, yeah, pretty fast, uh, try not to break too many things. But uh, yeah, and really make sure that um, when we're really at this more conceptual designing phase, we're testing, we're getting multiple rounds of feedback also, just to make sure that further down the road, we're avoiding any of those uh, surprises that we all love. And uh, yeah, so some of the questions, uh, and again, I'll focus a bit more specifically on the content stuff. Uh, how could we organize or optimize our information structures to improve uh, how people are finding information? Are they actually uh, completing the tasks they're supposed to be? Are we actually hitting those uh, objectives that we set for ourselves? Uh, are there ways we can really enhance the experience, whether it's a placement of elements, what the text of this call to action is and really uh, named, how the uh, labels on our navigation are called? Uh, to yeah, better support the overall objectives. And uh, what type of visual design elements? Obviously, we know accessibility is super important now. Otherwise, in terms of retrieval, there's all the work we do around optimizing for search engine. And uh, other things that are maybe a bit more, let's say, um, relegated to really uh, sometimes the end of the line, but uh, the editorial, the voice and tone, how are we really sort of manifesting who we are, what our brand is? It's very easy to say, okay, we have a, a documentation, I want the user to know how to do this, and you can sort of go step one, step two, step three. Uh, at the same time, is that gonna make the difference between an experience that's like, okay, or something that's gonna really make sure that users are coming to your site, come to know you, expect something, have a certain level of quality, and even go further, uh, make them uh, more than just a casual user, but someone who's gonna keep coming back. Uh, again, so that's all the different uh, types of elements where we can really infuse uh, best practices and content strategy to, uh, yeah, move our things to the, the next level. Uh, very quickly, uh, operationalizing, just do it. So now that we've sort of fleshed out all the different uh, parts of the concepts to make our strategy, we want to sort of see how they all really work together. So we're moving away from uh, the low fidelity, the wireframes, the maybe interactive prototyping into more of a, a build phase and uh, seeing uh, what's what. And uh, lastly, uh, um, oh yeah, so again, what is the status of everything we have to do and what's left to do, making sure that again, we're not in a race against uh, the, the timeline to get it all done uh, when we need to. Uh, and lastly, uh, the govern or the governance step. So again, I think this is one that, again, I don't wanna say it too loud because uh, we might not be in business, but <laughs> if everyone really uh, really governed their websites uh, super well, we probably have a little less business in terms of a website redesign projects, but that's neither here nor there. So obviously, uh, uh, what types of processes, tools, and uh, people, obviously, are uh, there to make sure that uh, yeah our product is being maintained not just technically with security and patches and migration everyone going to Drupal 10 uh, but also making sure that our content is being uh, updated if I have a blog and uh, the last entry is from two years ago uh, how is that really going to support uh, my reputation and sort of build that um, yeah that level of credibility reliability um, and yeah whatever sort of uh, performance outcomes or objectives we set in terms of our indicators uh, back in the strategy uh, how are we stepping up? Uh, yeah, so really post-launch, uh, who is going to do what? When are they going to do it? Uh, and uh, again, making sure that uh, what's really important, I think, is governance uh, should never be a document that someone writes and then puts it away, but something that's really living, which is why it's so great to see, uh, obviously, CMSs, including Drupal, have really uh, advanced and granular permissions, workflows, triggers, automatic stuff. 
Uh, there are so many things we can do to uh, make it happen, but at the end of the day, it really comes down to people and their desire to do so. So obviously we're looking at different contexts too. If it's, uh, let's say, a higher ed or government, do they have the same um, uh, incentive to keep everything up to date as someone who's in uh, e-commerce? Uh, so again, the case can always be different, but what's important is to make sure that you find people who believe in it and uh, that they take these jobs uh, seriously. Okay, so adding in content strategy. This is now the interactive portion of the presentation. Um, I'm gonna throw it to you if anyone is a brave volunteer, we're among friends. Uh, how do you define content strategy? What does content strategy mean to you? Or is that why you're all here today, I suppose? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no, I won't put anyone in the spot. I know it's I a... Think, I, I think content strategy is an intentional and deliberate kind of scaffolding for the content management system. And you're really planning for scalability and flexibility. Um, and that's what produces a longer living website, if you will. Um, yeah, and just like, you know, planning for all types of content um, we often go into projects where we see an information architecture that did not map to what their content needs are, and you just start seeing that little closet over here, the top level that that everything has been stuffed under, and so it's just solving for problems like that. <laughs> exactly, and again, I, I love uh, you said uh, the planning, the creation. It can be dynamic, it can be flexible. Again, it's going to actually uh, make the site what it is because, uh, quite frankly, unless you're, um, you know. I can't really think of any use case in terms of a website where content is not involved, whether it's text or images or multimedia, like however you're going to call it. At the same time, it has to have already a game plan in mind and then the actual way to put it into practice that's going to support it. Uh, and I'm really uh, big on saying uh, sometimes uh, we get caught up in uh, the user experience, the UX designers coming in, we're doing research. At the same time, uh, the experience uh, is everything. And I find in a certain point, uh, if the content is not there, as you say, if you're designing something with a lorem ipsum text everywhere, uh, you're gonna have problems at the end. If you're, I'm really sorry to hear, building information architecture without thinking about your content, uh, obviously that's a, a whole other <laughs> level of <laughs> Anyways, sure. we'll talk later. <laughs> Another problem. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to put up some, and again, I'm personally a big fan of uh, Christina Halverson, if you haven't uh, read about her. She's one of the sort of um, pioneers of the content strategy discipline, and uh, again, she's done really a lot for the actual um, expertise running conferences. But again, they're really simple definitions, and when we think about it, I like the idea that it's also uh, across the life cycle. So we're talking about, we're planning about the creation, how we're gonna publish it, how we're gonna manage or govern it, and make sure that it's uh, useful and uh, usable. Because so one without the other, it's just, uh, again, you're uh, sort of selling yourself short in terms of what your experience could actually be. Um, it's important also to see how it's actually uh, connecting uh, with uh, what we're trying to do or achieve our goals or objectives, but also understanding uh, who our users are and what do they actually need from us. And again, you're sort of gonna hit that sweet spot where everything sort of comes together. And uh, lastly, again, as we talked about the experience, uh, it's really how we're leveraging words, data, or any other types of content. Uh, I like how she says unambiguous. I would also add, uh, it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive, but it should be clear, and we should be able to build flexible structures where we can cross-reference, we can really uh, uh, double down on the create once and publish everywhere, and again, start to exercise our muscles, whether it's, uh, again, Drupal, WordPress, or whatever it is, to uh, support uh, these interactive experiences that we're trying to, uh, to generate. Um, so it's very foundational, all the more reason not to leave it till the end, and to be a bit more, uh, let's say, uh, practical and less uh, conceptual, uh, I like these sort of three um, uh, main areas of what content strategy can do. So obviously there's the nice, uh, the storytelling aspect, creating a really compelling experience, uh, maybe connecting a user to the content in a way that they're going to want to engage with, stay long on your site, sign up, apply, uh, what have you. Obviously there's the marketing, so ensuring that we're communicating uh, I know, our messaging, who we are, what we want you to do, what we can actually do for you. <laughs> it's always uh, a bit better also versus uh, the, uh, the other way around. And then lastly, it's about wayfinding. Uh, I think we've all had the experience, you just wanna go 
to a restaurant, uh, what are the hours of operation, and they're actually still open. Very simple information that as a regular user, uh, that's the first thing I want to know about you. I do not want to see your parallax scroll of all the pictures of every single dish that your restaurant has ever produced. Um, no, by that time, I'm, uh, I'm ready to pull out Uber Eats and call it a day. So uh, making information accessible to all users and also at the right time, the right place, and in the right format. And again, we're really going to see the power of uh, being able to build things out, personalization, recommendation, being able to uh, adapt. Uh, there's so many cool things going on, but at the end of the day, if you haven't put in the work to do the foundational stuff, uh, it's going to be nice uh, features and functionalities that are not actually going to get you anywhere in terms of uh, achieving your goals and making your users happy. Uh, so in terms of how, again, as I said, we have sort of a, the backstage and the front of house. So I just wanted to highlight some of the main uh, artifacts or deliverables that we're tending to work with. Uh, obviously, some are a bit more invisible. We're doing them more in the, the planning, discovery, and design phases. And some are obviously going to be uh, really uh, front and center. But uh, we'll take a look at them in the uh, following slides. But I just want to sort of uh, yeah, give a bit of an overview of uh, what we have going on. And uh, the why. So I feel like you guys are already pretty much convinced. I'm not going to belabor the point, but uh, obviously uh, I think uh, these questions are not unique to content strategy either. But again, making sure that we're talking about them at the very beginning can always help us when we're sort of caught up with this feature. We should do this. We could do this. Why don't we do this? Are we always connecting it back to uh, the why? Why do we exist? Who are we trying to reach? And again, uh, what does success actually look like? Which can really help us uh, calm the waters, say that's phase two, is that priority? And again, ensuring um, that content strategy is really treated uh, the same way. So as I said before, it can be quite counterproductive. It can wind up uh, redoing a lot of work, uh, wasting obviously time, energy, money. Uh, if you're uh, trying to reverse engineer your content to fit your beautiful design, rather than designing it uh, much more hand in hand. So again, uh, two birds, uh, one stone, uh, a complementary process. Uh, I wanted to, again, uh, put it a bit more in action and uh, dive a bit deeper, too, into the different uh, deliverables that uh, we saw before. So just as a quick recap, I'll use the same uh, uh, phase sort of approach to highlight uh, what comes when. Uh, in terms of discovery, uh, what can we really use to uh, guide these activities? So again, obviously, you need to first start by discovering uh, what content do we actually have. <laughs> And uh, it really is going to start, obviously, with the inventory and then take it one step further to name not just what we have, but uh, is what we have any good? Uh, should we keep it? Should we throw it out? And uh, yet, yeah, depending on how many uh, years of legacy you've been uh, storing up or how, let's say, uh, amazing your governance is, obviously, these documents can be uh, shorter or longer. Um, we'll also talk about our heuristic evaluation, any research, analysis, or auditing. Essentially, we're trying to get back to that current state, uh, what's going on now, and uh, map it against uh, the target. Uh, user journey mapping I'll talk a bit more too, but essentially uh, it's very complementary with content, which is why I'm super happy where we are at Evolving Web. Uh, we run this in parallel, so as a content strategist, I'm involved with our UX researchers. Uh, we're asking the stakeholders the same questions, so there's no reason to do uh, each one in our corner to sort of run the show. And it's very interesting too to sort of see how uh, things can sort of pop up that maybe we didn't know that this should be content, let's throw it in. Versus, again, the content is there, but it really just wasn't optimized in a way that uh, it was placed on the journey of a user. People weren't finding it for whatever reason. But we often find uh, working together that we can almost uh, answer these questions. And it's really amazing to sort of see users and stakeholders almost come up with the answer on their own. Uh, yeah, and lastly, uh, with uh, discovery wrapping up, we really want to be able to sort of hone in on uh, what strategy are we actually going to use in order to accomplish the goals, the measures of success that we've actually uh, set out. Uh, yeah, so fundamental is the inventory and the audit. Um, yeah, it sucks. It's really, really, really long. There are tools you can use to make it go a bit faster. We can do some indexing. If you have a sitemap already, uh, we're a bit ahead of the game. Uh, at the same time, I find uh, it makes building the information architecture way, way, way easier because for me, this is really a sort of, um, let's say, a three, four, and one. You build the inventory, and then you can actually just add on all the different uh, contextual descriptive information. We can use the uh, ROT. Is it redundant, outdated, or trivial content? Who's actually the owner? Do I have to have a subject matter expert to review it? And uh, any other type of sort of um, uh, information that's going to push us into a decision-making mode. 
and then afterwards it can really form the basis for the content that we decide it made the cut or we're just going to do some uh, updating to then start moving into the more um, uh, card sorting exercises we'll see in terms of developing the first draft of the information architecture and then actually mapping it back when we have the new architecture all set up we can really just add on columns uh, yeah my clients hate me but Excel, you can hide the uh, columns, so it's not so bad. Uh, but really, it gives a, a really clear uh, blueprint and uh, document that we can easily pass off to developers, so no one is asking questions about where is the navigation, this and that. So uh, consider this uh, the Bible. Uh, analytics, again, I won't belabor the point here, but obviously, uh, if you have users saying, um, uh, I can't do this, it's always going to sort of back it up with some more quantitative data, see uh, where in the journey are they falling off. Uh, one that we really come across with a lot uh, with uh, a lot of uh, higher education clients is uh, we're working for a specific faculty or a department and uh, the university says, hey, our logo has to be in the top left-hand corner of every single site. Okay, I've seen that. <laughs> and so what do they have to do? Okay, we'll get back to my homepage. If I'm the Faculty of Arts, I'm putting it right in the center. And uh, how many analytics assessments? I think my analytics guy is just like, uh, you don't have to ask me the question. It's always the same answer. When people click back, they're trying to go to the homepage because they wind up at the university site and then immediately have to bounce back to the faculty that they were looking at. So again, I don't know where in higher ed we didn't decide to follow industry best practices. It's a super simple fix, but luckily we have analytics to sort of, again, help reinforce or uh, yeah, make the, the pill a bit easier to swallow. And uh, no, we're doing one university at a time, so you guys uh, you have to join in. <laughs> Uh, next up, just a bit of a, a snapshot of a couple of the heuristic evaluations we've done. So again, we're a big fan of Evolving Web of using uh, the Nielsen Norman Group's uh, UX uh, usability um, uh, heuristics. So everything around uh, recognition versus recall, making sure that we're putting in the wayfinding cues. Again, making sure that our system is intelligent enough to uh, make sure that our users can easily adapt to it. We're not putting uh, additional barriers in their way. What's really nice about this, though, is that uh, we've been able to adapt it to add additional heuristics, whether they relate more specifically to the architecture, to the navigation, to even the content. And it can be anything from, uh, are we using PDFs for really important content? Maybe that's not so great. To uh, more classic stuff, uh, our tone is a bit dry. Is our content really compelling? Uh, do I want to use your service, go to your university, or buy your product? Uh, this is yeah, a good uh, example of uh, the user journey mapping. So um, we're using uh, mostly a Miro in terms of a uh, collaborative uh, whiteboarding. But again, the concept is quite simple. You sort of develop uh, your personas. And uh, here in this case, we have a, a prospective student uh, trying to compare different programs at a university. And what we'll do is we'll sort of look at the, the journey. And again, there can be journeys that overlap for, for different personas, content that can be useful for more than one audience. So the goal is not to silo them off but rather to sort of understand uh, where are the different um, uh, questions, needs, touch points, pain points through each sort of phase of the journey until I get to where I'm uh, ideally going. So in this case, I'm probably going to start out with an example of uh, I'm uh, awareness of uh, which universities, which programs are right for me. I want to move more into an information-seeking state where I'm sort of comparing what could this look like. And it could be anything from uh, what are the career options if I uh, uh, attend this school, uh, what's going to happen afterwards, to the very practical information. Uh, is there a place to live? How much is it going to cost me? So again, uh, so many uh, different things that are going through the minds of a user. And again, with attention spans uh, being uh, what they are, we really don't have so much time to uh, waste in uh, making users dig for information. So this is really a nice way to sort of see uh, where are the touch points Points. Oftentimes people will say, yeah, you're right, it's on the website, but people usually call me or email me because they can't find it and it's quicker that way. So obviously it's a really a simple um, uh, issue to solve. So while the journey mapping often brings up a lot of pain points, it also does often also have those uh, opportunities to actually address them. And uh, yeah, at the end of discovery, hopefully we've done a good job of uh, diagnosing and sort of summarizing uh, the biggest pain points. Here it's also helpful, especially when we go heuristic evaluation, it can go super detailed, but not all issues are created equally, so we can sort of help uh, prioritize and say, okay, what are we actually gonna tackle? What is actually gonna, again, map back to the different uh, goals that we have? And uh, lastly, really consolidate all those different opportunities that we uh, came across during the research and uh, yeah, try to uh, work it into uh, our new redesign strategy. And uh, something else that's sort of uh, closer to my heart is uh, what is a strategy? 
<laughs> because I think oftentimes we tend to use it as a bit of a catch-all and it's true it can also sort of expand or contract depending on who's using it but I really like to frame it as uh, again what are the goals and how are we actually going to accomplish them that, that's the end of it so uh, in this case uh, if we're looking at uh, I think it's the case of um, a higher ed client uh, the goal is to have a, a better calls to action because you want more conversions, more people applying, and we want to reduce phone calls to the admissions office because no one can actually apply online. <laughs> so uh, uh, in this case, I think we are in a situation where there are way too many calls to action. They didn't have a consistent styling look and feel. They weren't placed optimally there, and we didn't really have a good distinction between what are the primary ones, so I'm ready to go, where do I sign up, make sure uh, that they can really find those versus the lower priority ones for those who are sort of, uh, I'm not sure if I want to make a commitment, I can still manifest my interest, we're collecting an email address, they're downloading one of our brochures. Uh, yeah. So the recommendation there is simply how we're going to uh, yeah, achieve it, that is the strategy. And a similar example uh, for the program selector, and again, this one is also a bit close because it's, um, uh, I think it also illustrates um, a big issue with a lot of organizations, institutions that tend to say, we're organized like this, this is my hierarchy, this is my department, this is what it's called, just put that on the website, which uh, again, as we know, is um, uh, you are not your user, and uh, specifically with uh, higher ed, uh, the different programs that we have, uh, no one is necessarily gonna know the difference between, uh, our recent one we had was um, for a faculty of uh, media and design, uh, and they had really cool programs. I wanna be a video game designer, I wanna work in cinema production, but uh, they were all sort of, uh, um, classified in uh, these uh, departments that didn't have any real connection. Even if I was searching for movies or film or cinema, I really had to navigate. I have to know it's in this department to get to the program. So it's really about sort of flipping that on its head and saying, uh, look, uh, how are uh, people actually uh, searching? What do they want to do? Is it by a career? Is it by a topic? Is it by an interest? And uh, again, a lot of the recommendations you might up here are just to uh, show everything by default, give the users uh, the lay of the land, and uh, maybe put in some filters or some uh, different ways to slice and dice the data that are going to a bit more align with uh, their actual mental models. And uh, again, it's important for universities, obviously, to say this is our department, these are our faculties, this is how we run things, but it shouldn't be incompatible with the way that, again, your uh, priority user audiences are actually going to get to the information they need and, uh, yeah, take the next, uh, the next step. Hey, can I, I have a pet example of this, uh, the Montreal parking app, <laughs> if you want to look for it in the app store, you can't type in Montreal parking, that would be nice. You can't type in Stasimon <laughs> de Montréal, which is the name of the organization that is in charge of that. You have to type in service, mobile. Why? Because inside of the organization, Stasimon de Montréal, they have a team that's in charge of their mobile app. <laughs> and so their parking app is called service mobile. Everybody knows that, right? <laughs> <laughs> but at least the icon is a big icon, so that's how you know you're talking about it. Are we pitching him soon? <laughs> I <is that. laughs> Okay. Moving into uh, designing and testing. So again, uh, to go a bit quicker, but obviously the main deliverables here are really going to be that content model, which again, if you guys are Drupal, uh, I think uh, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, what structure do we need? Uh, which metadata? Which uh, taxonomies for which content types? And uh, what's shared? Uh, what's uh, distinct? Um, obviously the IA and the navigation. So again, really making sure we're distinguishing between the architecture itself, which is supposed to comprise everything, versus navigation, which are really those the user interface elements that are actually going to appear. Uh, which elements should be shown where, and really make sure that it's coherent, it's supporting uh, the target uh, user journeys. Uh, we'll look at uh, some wireframes too, which is, again, we get to the fun part where uh, the designers are happy, and then obviously uh, the style, the voice, the tone, so all our copywriters, our copy editors are, uh, yeah, um, uh, getting involved too. Uh, so the content model, obviously I, I think we sometimes take for granted how uh, dynamic uh, web content is. Uh, for example, on a home page, it's very easy to pull in, uh, hey, the upcoming events, the most recent news, uh, filter all the blog posts that are by this author on this topic, uh, so again, it's a very simple way, and it's a, a template that we use is a super adaptable, but we're just going to say, what are the content types, what are they called, these sort of entities, and then uh, do the sort of, again, very back and work of saying, what are the attributes, uh, are they mandatory, are they optional, is it a taxonomy value, is it free text, okay, what's the taxonomy, um, again. 
I, I like it also, it takes me back to the sort of a, a, <laughs> the library focus thing, where again, it's just moving from a very uh, physical context to digital, but obviously digital opens up so many more uh, opportunities, so uh, it's great. So uh, whereas uh, the content model is just documenting the content types with their components, uh, metadata, as we know, data about data, attributes that describe your content, and taxonomy is closed list of uh, values that only uh, super power admins have the opportunity to change. No. <laughs> Taxonomy should definitely be dynamic and growing with your organization, but again, keep some governance on there, you're going to have uh, issues uh, down the way. And again, moving from uh, an information architecture, um, uh, a current uh, to a future, uh, a lot of fun, but again, this is where you sort of uh, bring your content inventory, your audit to life. So all the content that uh, made the cut, we can just go crazy. I spent a lot of time in here, and um, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> not for the, the faint of heart, but essentially we really want to distinguish between the entire, uh, uh, the big picture, the overall structure, everything, and again, what elements are going to be visible, uh, whether it's in the primary navigation, my secondary navigation, utility, footer, header, uh, left hand, right hand, uh, uh, and more. But anyways, uh, I think it's a really nice um, opportunity too because uh, the possibilities uh, really uh, multiply in terms of trying to serve multiple audiences. So again, higher ed, if you have uh, future prospective students that are really the, uh, the main target, but we don't want to neglect uh, current students who still have stuff to do on the website, uh, our faculty, our staff, and even uh, obviously uh, community members, potential donors, alumni. There are multiple ways to sort of uh, adapt your navigation so it can be either contextual, uh, based on a, a user type, based on a topic, uh, et cetera. And uh, yeah, I wanted to just uh, quickly go over uh, two methods that we use. Uh, this phase is called design and test, and really want to emphasize the testing because even if uh, uh, you build something, you think it's amazing, it's great. Uh, if at the end of the day it's not actually working <laughs> the way it intended, uh, go back to the drawing board. So I don't know if anyone knows the um, uh, Optimal Workshop uh, suite of tools, but uh, yeah, for we're big fans of doing uh, their online uh, card sorting and tree testing. So essentially here is really just a way to sort of all that content that we uh, so uh, um, studiously uh, mapped out and honored in, everything that makes the cut goes on a post-it or on a virtual card, and then we're gonna ask all our different users to sort of uh, put it side by side and really try to understand uh, who organizes what and how. So a really easy example is if we have a bunch of different uh, policies and procedures and forms and resources, well, some people will go right away with like, okay, we're going by format, I'm putting all my policies here, and you have to know if there's a security policy or an email policy or whatever it is, uh, start with policy and then go down versus others who are much more subject-based, which again, makes sense. Uh, you wanna say, look, I want everything about security, I want everything about health and safety. So essentially, these tools are just gonna let you uh, understand the different uh, similarities or the affinities between uh, two pieces of content and help you make the right decisions for uh, should these be grouped together, uh, these two have nothing to do with each other, uh, these two have something to do with each other, but only for that really, really small percentage of user, uh, do they matter? And also, obviously, because we're in uh, the hyperlinked world, uh, can we make it work both ways? Uh, why not? And uh, next up is uh, tree testing. Once we're sort of aligned on a pretty good structure that we want to uh, propose to users, again, it's just a really uh, simple way to link it back to your objectives. What tasks are my users trying to actually complete? And uh, can they do so with this representation of a menu? So say I need to uh, figure out, um, uh, what is it? Uh, find beyond the classroom uh, and uh, essentially uh, you'll give the user a task and sort of measure how uh, efficiently or directly and even confidently are they selecting the known where we place that content. So essentially you can sort of say did someone click a one two I'm here uh, very easy very clear unambiguous or were they sort of going up and down in the tree looking for the right answer and taking a bit more time? So we can have either um, direct success, indirect success, in which you made it, but not before a lot of searching, uh, as well as failures. And again, all of this data is gonna help us really refine uh, the final uh, uh, information architecture and the navigation elements that we'll display. Um, yeah, and so once we've done all that nice uh, backstage work, we're ready to move into a bit more of the front stage stuff uh, with our wireframes. So we're going to really look at stuff, uh, how components are going to be laid out, what the page structure looks like. Um, we can see navigation, calls to action, and really get a sort of sense of moving through the site as this user. Um, where am I going to go from step one to step two, step three, moving back a little bit. 
So again, the important thing is to make sure it's low fidelity and to really educate uh, people you're showing it to. This isn't what it's going to look like, don't worry. But at the same time, it's a pretty good uh, way to sort of, uh, yeah, get the pieces of the skeleton in there. And uh, obviously, with um, a more representative content, uh, the better, because otherwise, yeah, the experience is not going to really uh, ring true. Uh, yeah, and a couple of examples uh, more for reference in terms of style, voice, and tone. So I like the example of a uh, MailChimp a lot, just because I think it's a really great way to sort of see uh, how a brand is sort of uh, creating uh, who they are and then commuting their message, uh, communicating their message uh, through every sort of touch point, uh, whether it's on their website, on emails they're sending you, or any types of uh, yeah, digital uh, touch points there. So in the case of MailChimp, we're going with human, which is uh, usually better than a non-sentient, but um, familiar, friendly, straightforward. And again, what's really nice is to sort of uh, go back to a, a very fundamental um, uh, principle in knowledge management, which is called concept analysis. So what it is and what isn't it, which is uh, sometimes you can sort of say, I know it when I see it, but it's always nice to try to build in the sort of uh, barometers or guidelines to sort of make sure that we're all uh, on the same playing field. So when we say, okay, we're helpful, but not overbearing, I love the expert, but not bossy, and all of these are gonna sort of inform the word choice, the style, essentially all the different elements of language that you'll inject into your content to make sure that it's reinforcing and supporting the overall experience. Uh, again, a simple uh, example also of uh, the sort of concept analysis, but more in a table. So per attribute, you can actually go in and say, what do we mean by this to ensure, uh, again, this professional mean the same thing in uh, a context of MailChimp versus a context of higher education? Probably not. So with the do's and don'ts, you can really uh, help those people who are going to, at the end of the day, be responsible for your governance, uh, know exactly uh, where to go. And another useful tool also that we find uh, uh, is super helpful in workshops with stakeholders is to sort of, uh, again, situate ourselves in terms of uh, these different dimensions. You can play around with the different uh, opposites uh, as you wish, but uh, again, it sort of helps us sort of uh, uh, identify where are we trying to be, where are we today, do these two people not agree at all, and sort of see if we can uh, meet in the middle or, again, throw that attribute out and say we'll start with something uh, that makes more sense for us. And uh, lastly, just a couple of examples of style guides. And uh, again, I think we're uh, past the days of sort of that big uh, branding package that you can uh, download as a big zip file on websites and to do something a bit more interactive. Your content editors will thank you if they can at least use Control F to find out what they're looking for. Hyperlink is always better. And again, everything from are we doing uh, the American English, more Canadian, British? Um, are we putting uh, dots in our acronyms? Uh, and uh, use of the Oxford comma, all those uh, highly contested topics that uh, our content uh, uh, creators love to talk about, everything is going to go in our style guide. And uh, yeah, to uh, keep things going, operationalize, uh, it's very simple in terms of content strategy, it just needs to be organized, and as we saw, if you've done a good job already from your inventory to your audit to your mapping, it should go pretty fast, you'll already know who's responsible for what, who needs to um, write it, who needs to get it approved, which is the subject matter expert, uh, what's missing, and uh, how are we gonna measure compliance? Uh, which uh, standards are we actually measuring against, whether they're accessibility, uh, optimizing with our meta tags for search, and uh, yeah, essentially measuring uh, the um, that gap in the sense of uh, getting it done. So yeah, we use uh, many examples, but I'm sure uh, you guys can figure out uh, the ones that work best for you. Uh, simpler is always best, but make sure it's something that's not gonna be, again, if it's uh, a burden to keep up to date, uh, it's not gonna happen. So as much as we can, try to keep it uh, in the workflow of the project and something that uh, users are not going to fight against. And lastly, uh, for governance, so again, uh, the uh, people, processes, and tools, who's responsible for managing content across the life cycle, uh, how often, and again, this could really vary by type of content. Obviously, there's evergreen stuff that maybe needs a review every six months versus uh, the more uh, timely stuff that we want to make sure is uh, continually updated to uh, keep things fresh, uh, depending on what your goals are, what tools, um, yeah, and what workflows are we going to build in to our Drupal. Um, I put two examples there of a centralized, decentralized. Obviously, we can also have hybrid models, but essentially, uh, how much power do you want to give how many people? Um, how much time do you want between uh, creation, approval, and actual publication? And uh, how, uh, let's say, uh, flexible or uh, dynamic are the people actually participating? Um, and again, sometimes uh, are we asking for uh, forgiveness or permission, uh, depending on uh, where we are? 
but uh, in any case, uh, there's uh, many uh, different varieties, but uh, the best is to find one that actually will work for you, and ideally, as we said, can be automated and make it uh, as easy as possible to uh, actually uh, adhere to it. And lastly, just a bit of an example document in terms of uh, the different roles, who's responsible for it in terms of governance. It can go beyond the content itself in terms of uh, the real day-to-day -day and really talk about who's responsible for whole sections, the website itself. And this is also something we can look back to and say, okay, your website hasn't really been looked at in uh, five, six, uh, seven years. Whose fault is that? We can go right up to the chain of command and say, oh, okay, sponsor was not doing his work. Uh, again, I know it's uh, glib to say, oh, you boot and put it in a drawer, but again, the reality is uh, we all have so much going on at the same time. It depends uh, to what extent are we uh, prioritizing uh, your website, your digital property as uh, a key uh, uh, part of your strategy. And again, uh, if it's working for you, I think that's always the best incentive to keep it working for you. Uh, if it never was working that great in the, in the first place or you weren't really satisfied, obviously uh, you have uh, much less of motivation to uh, keep things going. So a couple of key takeaways, obviously the content strategy course uh, needs to be uh, a bit more in lockstep, uh, not in parallel, not in silos, not throwing things over the other side, but ideally uh, we want to get that, uh, that two horse carriage going on, three horse, five horse. Uh, the second one is really uh, focused on, again, um, uh, the user. I, I think uh, for me at least it's uh, the first real context in sort of a more agency setting, so I'm really learning about what does it mean to say is the client always right and uh, make sure uh, trust but verify. But again, taking a very user-centered approach, uh, backing yourself up with as much data and a more quantitative or objective uh, uh, analysis that you can. And again, not being afraid to say, look, uh, the first time it probably won't be right. Iterate, don't get too attached to what you're doing because uh, chances are it will change. And uh, most of these deliverables also are meant to be dynamic in any sense. Uh, it wouldn't make, uh, um, it wouldn't be very logical to say, okay, our taxonomy is now uh, uh, <laughs> set in stone. Uh, these things evolve and they change and you have to make sure that you're designing your experiences to be able to keep up. And uh, lastly, uh, we're not gonna kill two birds with one stone or as uh, we heard last night from uh, the PETA is trying to rebrand, it's, um, don't kill the birds, but um, feed two birds with a scone. So uh, I'll let you uh, take your pick if we're uh, <laughs> And then we're gonna stay, in terms of a content strategy, we're gonna stay at the level of, uh, it's a metaphor. Uh, but in any case, uh, if that's uh, a couple of the takeaways uh, you've had today, I hope I've uh, done my job. And again, if you want to know more, if you want to collaborate, uh, tell us all about the content challenges that are keeping you up at night. We are here. Uh, we're Evolving Web. Uh, again, we're a Drupal-focused, uh, full-service agency. So uh, strategy, UX, content strategy, architecture, to uh, design, development, and maintenance. Uh, we do it all, but uh, come by and uh, check us out at the booth in the back. And I can take some questions, or I can let you go to get lunch as you wish, but anyways, uh, thank you for your attention. It's been all Go ahead. You mentioned um, in your big spreadsheet of the past tense inventory, you mentioned some tools. What are your favorite tools for scraping a site or for getting the past inventory? Uh, Could you repeat that? Yeah, so the question was, uh, any favorite tools for uh, generating the content inventory? To be super honest, I'm super manual. I find that it gets me in the zone. I, I know the content that way versus if I'm generating it. But uh, the tool that we are using is called Screaming Frog. And I think it's uh, quite affordable, but uh, there must be other terms on the market. But at the same time, I see it as an investment at the beginning. If I know uh, front and back uh, the content, I'm gonna be much faster in terms of building out the next architectures and everything. So, yes. For, for a, a decentralized content governance model, do you have any suggestions for processes or tools for nudging responsible people into actually maintaining and reviewing the content? All right, so the question was, any suggestions for uh, encouraging people in a decentralized uh, governance model to actually update their content? Uh, I would honestly say apply a centralized model and see what they say. <laughs> <laughs> no, at a certain point also, uh, it's, uh, it's the carrot or the stick. And uh, again, I'm not a fan of uh, cajoling or trying to, again, if they don't want to do it, they're not going to do it. When they see that there's a problem, when their content looks super out of date, again, when it's going to actually affect their lives, 
then you're going to be able to uh, bring them along a bit more. And uh, again, uh, so again, that's just me, but I'm sure there are ways to be a bit more uh, uh, diplomatic about it. And again, it could also uh, go uh, through some more in-depth training. There could be other issues at play. They're not sure. They're not comfortable. They're not getting notifications. So trying to troubleshoot, again, taking my own advice and putting myself in the shoes of a, a user as well. Maybe it's a time issue. Maybe you want to think about, yes, it's decentralized, but we have a backup or we have a certain uh, grace period if you haven't done it here. So again, trying to be a bit more um, uh, flexible with some of the things and again, trying to, to meet them a bit more uh, where they are. Yeah. Do you want the higher ed question or do you want the specific question? I think we got time for both. Okay, so uh, higher ed one. Um, higher ed clients, I work with a number of them in my current role. Uh, they are famously attached to the way that things are. What obstacles have you run into uh, with higher ed clients who are too attached to the way things were or worked on their present site? And how'd you get past them? Uh, yeah. Well, so the question is uh, for a particularly higher ed clients who are super attached to the way things are, the way they want things to be, how do you sort of uh, work on the, uh, the change management, uh, breaking down some of the resistance? Uh, I can always sort of bring it back to uh, why did you hire us? Um, again, I've actually have had a client say, you know what you presented is, it's not revolutionary enough. We were expecting something a bit more, which was great. You know, when you don't know how large the playing field is, you don't know how far you're actually going to get to go. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I think it's always good to sort of uh, go back to what are we trying to accomplish, that sort of current state. Are you happy with the way things are? And again, trying to say, are there other all these underlying reasons for uh, why these things should be the way they are? And again, given that we're in a bit more of a the flexible environment, I find there are often ways to make uh, some compromises. Uh, we've been doing it a lot with some clients too to sort of say, look, you need to get our prospective students uh, into the programs and move them a bit further along the funnel so that if they're not clicking apply, at least they're asking for information. We're not gonna destroy your department organization structure. You're still gonna have uh, your stuff over here, but just separate it into separate nodes. Let them move back and forth. And again, it's a great way to sort of uh, apply the principle of uh, orienting, uh, making people uh, comfortable and getting to know you. Uh, and at the same time, uh, I think it's something that, uh, as you say, there are always gonna be those sort of uh, immovable rocks. <laughs> If you can't go through, over, under, around, and again, uh, there are usually things that we can either find uh, a compromise on, uh, but again, if uh, you're in a more client-focused uh, uh, agency role, uh, sometimes it's going to be up to the consultant to say, uh, look, um, this is the conflict we have, who is supposed to arbitrate, and that's where, again, my project managers will get out the race seat and <laughs> take a decision. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Drupal is super powerful at relating content, reusing content, etc. At what point do you bring your ideas to your technical team and vet your uh, concept against what they're capable or comfortable with implementing? Yeah, so uh, right out of the gate, we always include a technical discovery in the first phase also, so we can really sort of compare notes, see what are they working with, uh, and again, it helps also to cross-check it with the actual project manager to say, okay, this is what their environment is today. Uh, these things are off the table. We can't build these modules. They don't have the bandwidth to create more than X number of content types. So at the very least, out of the gate, we sort of have the, uh, the, the constraints in line. Uh, yeah, and then otherwise, uh, we always uh, schedule in um, like dedicated um, either knowledge transfer uh, sessions. And again, we try to, our offices are next to each other. Uh, so physically also between a UX design, content, and tech, uh, they're just sort of a, a knock on the door away to figure it out. But uh, again, we're not perfect at it, but it's something that I think, uh, again, as long as you're aware of it, uh, you can uh, try to, to do it more and more. What's helped us also in a more agency setting is doing a lot of uh, retrospectives and knowledge sharing. Uh, yeah, what could we do better next time? And uh, obviously, it's uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, fears is that either, okay, we have to start development now because the developers are ready. We have no more design hours, but we're not ready. And uh, it's a constant uh, uh, adjustment, but uh, again, one, uh, we're in it together and uh, sort of focusing on our core values, our collaboration, uh, transparency, and uh, the reason why we're with Drupal is really to ensure that we're not doing proprietary stuff. We want our clients to be partners, and we are their partners in terms of, uh, yeah, bringing their vision, uh, their story to life. And so it's super important that uh, we also uh, model that behavior internally. Um, sorry. Go ahead. So can you elaborate a little on your, your, you just mentioned the scheduled knowledge transfer at the end of discovery. Do you have a process for that? What does that look like? 
Uh, it, it, to be honest, it, it really uh, will depend, but uh, we uh, sort of use uh, the Agile development with the Scrum. So obviously uh, we're doing Scrums all along the life cycle of the project, so it's quite sort of easy for, even if the developer is just sort of listening in on the call, they sort of have a sense of what's going on. And again, really just ensuring that our um, uh, another uh, side project we have internally is working on our own uh, governance and content management. So is the wiki up to date? Are all the final deliverables linked from the Google Drive folder? And again, ensuring that if a developer does have a question uh, when it's not actually the formal knowledge transfer, they can at least try to figure it out on their own. And then, yeah, it's really just a sit down when we're sort of preparing the, the real, uh, the handoff. And uh, we just budget it into the sort of uh, the schedule so it's on the timeline of the project. And uh, again, even if it's a smaller thing, it's just one or two hours, it's always helpful to say, hey, it's sort of that, uh, that item that I want to check off before I can actually move into the next phase. Yeah. That was great. It was so thoughtful and thorough across the board. So wonderful. Thank you. Um, content, I think, is the Achilles heel of, of web projects. And it's always been a pain point when working with clients to get what you need for content. Um, and you, you spoke to some great approaches. This is a couple facets, this question. But I think, um, how do you work with clients to one budget a true content art exercise in architecture because I think like Halverson said herself, clients do not want to pay for what the real cost of addressing content is on big sites. You know, if you break it down to eight hours a page and you, you're working with hundreds or thousands of pages, you know, you're talking about big bucks when the project budget is only so much. So I'd like to understand that. But then also, you know, you go in and clients I find are very explainy because they know their business. And I don't mean explain in a good way, um, as, as users actually need it to be explained. But uh, you know, just too technical and, and too direct, um, yeah, dry. Uh, how do you work with clients when there is no brand voice uh, to help suss that out with them if that budget or the project is not, you're not doing the branding exercise for them, right? So can you walk through kind of both the budget and taking clients through that kind of thinking? Sure. Uh, sorry, I haven't been repeating them. <laughs> but part one, uh, so how do you do with clients who don't actually have the, the budget or the desire to pay for uh, yeah, a copywriter or a copy editor to actually address content, which as you said, uh, uh, so uh, correctly is often the Achilles heel, really, uh, yeah, the sort of uh, the, the, the cornerstone there. Um, again, in most of the projects that we're on, as you said, it wouldn't be effective uh, as an agency necessarily in terms of time. We don't actually have a horde of content strategists at the ready to sort of say, okay, uh, <laughs> let me add it, give me the brand, uh, the style guide, and I'm going to go for it, uh, nor the budget uh, on the client side either. At the same time, I think what's important is to go back to the values of uh, we're partners, and as you said also, clients know their content the best, and I think it's really sort of uh, being able to sort of take them along, show them what's possible, and again, if they can invest for, as you say, a limited budget and we can actually show them, yeah, sort of the, the teaser or the preview of what you can get and also follow that up really quickly with training. So making sure that we're talking to their SMEs and that uh, they have not just the technical, I can actually use the interface and this and that, but uh, we're doing exercises with them. We'll generally build in a couple of uh, deliverables into the sort of discovery or the design, uh, which is really around, uh, again, involving them in more interactive workshops, making sure they feel empowered, they feel owners. The last thing you want to sort of come in and say, hey, uh, we're building this for you, we'll see you in uh, three months. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not the way it goes. And at the same time, uh, make them sort of, again, stakeholders in the process and that, hey, look, we're building out uh, these wireframes. We don't want to show you lorem ipsum. Can you get uh, these SMEs to produce a paragraph? It'll sort of help them, again, get in the mindset training them. And obviously, it's always helpful with internally, you have a, a, a group of stakeholders. You can try to uh, hit your star to a champion, someone who gets it, who wants to do it, who has maybe been saying this internally for years, but has never actually been listened to, or this and that. And again, try to do a bit of a snowball effect and uh, get some uh, some nice influence in there too. Yeah. Um, and part two, uh, I'm sorry, remind me. Um, what was part two? Dry content, dry content or like two in the weeds of your own business. Oh, the explaining, the explaining. The explaining yes. part. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so for clients who have a really uh, no real uh, basis or a foundation, uh, it's something, again, uh, we're offering it, but it's a bit of a newer service because we're not, uh, you know, fully staffed internally, but we are working. Uh, the slides I showed are coming from actual workshops that we do run to sort of help get people started. It doesn't have to be a style guide of 150 pages with this and that. It could be as simple as saying, what do we actually need? What content do we have? And who are we as a brand? So we work uh, pretty closely 
to with uh, our visual design team who are experts in uh, really sort of uh, evoking uh, what are the elements that are going to really convey who we are, our personality, and again, they're going to take it and translate it into the typography, the colors, maybe a logo refresh, and on the content side, we work really hand in hand to use all those insights for, again, uh, a different outcome, but really trying to focus on uh, what are the attributes of our personality, what do those attributes actually mean uh, for this organization, and how are they going to be manifested, whether it's through the image choices we use, the labels, the text, uh, and all the different uh, yeah, content uh, language uh, aspects. I also, one word if I can, I don't want to hog up the, the room. Uh, how do you get clients to think about content as more than just like the words on the page? Because one of the problems is you turn over CMS and they're not thinking about graphs, data, tables, the responsiveness nature of all of your content and how that should flow. Um, either in the way of building parameters or, or bumpers, you know, on their content. What's your approach to figure that? Yeah, I think the best approach is to really always start with uh, with real content as much as possible, sample to what's going to most closely actually approximate it. Because uh, you know, if you get uh, one word is wrong in what you're showing them, it's a game over. You're going to spend the next uh, 25 minutes of the presentation. This was just an example meant to. Uh, so uh, yeah, in any case, I think uh, that's a way to sort of uh, you want them to build uh, feel that they have actual skin in the game. And as you say, you can really sort of turn it back when they start saying this was wrong and this was wrong. Say so you're absolutely right. This is a fundamental pillar that, again, you are the experts. Uh, you have the knowledge for this, and we need you to make it happen. Uh, there are limits to how far you can go in the client uh, agency or relationship, and uh, and that's the way it should be too. Otherwise, uh, again, you're going to get in a situation where uh, they're, they're poaching your uh, your employees from the agency to come work in house, which again is maybe testament to uh, the value that you've convinced them of the content itself. But again, make sure they feel like they have skin in the game, and uh, again, that it's going to be important. Uh, it's really the basis of something that's again useful and usable and as you said it's going to turn around uh, the content uh, three minutes or two minutes and you guys are ready for a uh, for lunch I hope yeah, yeah. amazing thank you so much and again we'll be at the booth in the back uh, please uh, stop by and say hi